Canada's unbroken boreal wilderness represents 25% of the world's remaining ancient forests. It is globally significant in its role as species habitat, water filter, and carbon storage. The largest area of intact boreal forest in Canada is in Manitoba and Ontario. While southern parts of this forest have already been heavily logged, the area north of roughly 51 degrees latitude remains unallocated to industry and mostly undisturbed. Recent moves by forestry, hydro, and mining interests now threaten the ecological integrity north of 51. In the summer of 2007, Taku Hokoyama and myself, Frank Wolf, set off from Winnipeg on a 3,100 kilometer canoe journey through the region in an attempt to paddle to my cottage in southern Ontario. This is Borealis. paddling on this dock because I was invited to join uh, my friend and co-worker Frank Wolf on a 3,000 kilometer canoe expedition through uh, the Ontario Boreal Forest. I've done uh, two canoe trips in my entire life, about two days each. I've put in quite a few four-hour days here, uh, but it's just not the same as a 12-hour day for 80 consecutive days, I'm concerned. A lot of apprehension here. I don't go in feeling strong, and I certainly don't go in feeling confident. Yeah, I really don't know what Frank was thinking when he chose me. If you like adventure, you like uncertainty, and you like the outdoors, it's, it's just irresistible. How could you say no to that? Can I say no to that now? No, too late? Am I committed already? Crossroads of Portage and Main in downtown Winnipeg, and just a couple blocks from the Red River, and the beginning of our 3,000 kilometer expedition into the Big Wild Boreal Forest. Here we go, off to the big wild. Push off, Taku.
can see here that the Bird River is definitely in complete flood. This is the Portage Trail here, going right through, and the rivers come right over it. It's uh, July 1st, Canada Day, and the bugs are going crazy. So are the rivers. So it's slow going up the bird. So this is Tulabi Lake and the beginning of Nopaming Provincial Park and also the beginning of the roadless boreal forest. So we are now entering the big wild. Woo! There's a strange bias I have, but the further we get into the boreal forest, the it's almost like the water conditions your skin. You, you get out and you feel, skin feels good, supple, energetic, I don't know. Like a spa. Detox, it's like a spa. It certainly is like a spa. I could, you could bottle this water and sell it to people for people to put in their baths. It's that good. I'm not just saying this, you have to swim in it for yourself. Come to the Boreal Forest and swim in the water and you will find out for yourself that I'm not lying. Do it. Okie dokie. Blackfly bites. How are the bugs, Taku? Wonderful. It's like having a bath in your own blood. Kind of like Vietnam without the bullets. Alright, so uh, we're basically just at the end of another complete bushwhack portage, um, just after Embryo Lake here in Woodland Caribou. And there literally is no trail here at all. Like we couldn't, we were just kind of going along the edge of this little jammed up uh, creek. And just at the end here, I found this bottle just in the dirt. So it's uh, just kind of half buried in the dirt. And uh, it actually says inside, there's a little note like on a cigarette wrapper inside this old bottle it says uh it comes out as galedra something like that it might be a last name and it says 50 days on july 12th 1967. so this bottle has been here for 40 years it's like a time capsule left behind at the end of a now non-existent portage trail all right so just kind of further uh, looking at this uh, bottle i found on the portage earlier today um it actually says Celebrating 50 days on trip, uh, Bill E. something and Harry Harvey. So the boys drank this on day 50 and uh, no one's found it since until us.
So cheers to you, men of 40 years ago. Just keeping track of time, day 10. Doku, what are you uh, making there? Uh, we're making some uh, spruce tea. We take the uh, fine green tips off a of sp black spruce, uh, steep it in boiling water, and you get this incredibly refreshing uh, tea that's pretty much available anywhere along the Boreal Forest. Uh, this was a traditional thing that I believe the, uh, the, uh, the Cree and the Chippewan used uh, in daily life. Spruce tea. Refreshing. That is a good brew today. It is. Mm -hmm. Strong. But good. Oh, this one by my ear. When we uh, get into the tent, a whole bunch of mosquitoes always follow us in, and it's our uh, nightly ritual to cleanse the tent. And as you can see, as we kill the mosquitoes, sometimes they're full of our blood already, and it leaves wonderful art. That's a nice piece, and uh, Frank just made a piece uh, higher up on the ceiling here, which I'm particularly fond of. That's fresh. Ooh, glistening. <laughs> That's upstream paddling on the Root River. Moments of sheer energy. You get over a little hump that's coming down against you in the river. And then a bit of relaxation in the eddy above. Repeat. For about 60 or 70 kilometers. portage on the Root River and what we've got here basically is a former burn so all these logs have fallen down they're streaked with soot uh, so a fire came through here a few years ago you can also see behind me here there's this big thicket of jack pine and so the jack pines require fire for their cones to actually open up they're these thick tight cones and once the fire comes through they'll open up and they'll seed the uh, freshly fertilized with ash soil and pop up and you can see they're so dense they're all fighting for space in here so it's a really good example of how the boreal forest regenerates itself
day 20. One of the big issues facing the Boreal Forest is damming of all the rivers for hydroelectric power. In this trip, we've got these sweet solar panels here. And basically two of these is basically like uh, plugging in your uh, batteries into a, a wall unit at home. So they give us lots of juice and keep us powered up all the way. So with emerging technologies and the efficiencies, uh, things like damming up rivers for hydroelectric power can be replaced by solar, wind power, and other very green uh, energy alternatives. Beach swim! We got our parcel. Success. Another two weeks worth of food. Right here. The First Nations of this uh, territory are prepared to fight for what for them not to come and do to any development. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like there is a lot of. Uh, There's no benefit to the people. Yeah. The only th the only benefit you probably get is a stumpage fee, is like, which is nothing. nothing. And that's very temporary too. Yeah. Once it's yeah. gone, it's yeah. gone. I suppose. Yeah. 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 You can plant and what? This. Wait another hundred years for a new set of trees? New, you know, like that's growth. not. Yeah. And then you'll be gone and won't have enjoyed it, I guess. Yeah. 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 So what I would like to see for my, I have grandchildren. I'd like to Second. see them um, enjoy. Yeah. The green forest and you know, like just a natural thing of everything. Mm -hmm. It's it's nice to be around. It's like we're fortunate and very lucky to live here. Yeah, this is one of the yeah. the last in Canada, well in this area yeah. anyways. Like there's it's untouched. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still pretty much virgin up here. Yeah, yeah. You know. So we're there's proud no to say that we're here. Yeah. And we'll be here for a long time yet. I did a Boreal Forest Action Tour, <laughs> and what I did is I traveled from mainly, you know, a lot of colleges and universities, mainly Yale University, um, NYU, I went to the University of Illinois, letting the students know where the, their, their paper was coming from, but it was to more or less encourage them to start buying recyclable paper instead of brand new paper, because every time you buy, you print off a new paper, that's the death of a tree climate change, you know, global warming is still continuing. And this is for, um, what's his name there, Al Gore. Is that his name there? Yes, indeed. That guy? Yeah. Well, anyways, he's talking about this big thing about global warming, you know, climate change and all that. Well, quit clear cutting the trees, you know what I mean? Because, yeah. I mean, the virgin forest is here. You know, this is the last of the forest of Ontario. This is the last of it. The waterways you guys are going to travel down, you know, like it'll probably be dried up seven years from now, ten years from now. Three years from now, you never know. Mm -hmm. That's good. I'm gonna switch the camera angle here. Let's take a look at this line here.
Uh, the action is uh, its a little bit of a blur for me. Um, I'm still new to uh, canoeing in general, and in particular whitewater. We were lined up really well, but uh, occasionally, like, you know, oh, there's a boulder headed for us, and all I hear is hard, 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 and I don't know, am I supposed to draw hard? Am I supposed to go forward? Forward, hard, 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 hard forward! No. Bump goon. Whoa! Did I do the right thing? Hopefully, I'll get better as the uh, rapids continue. Another rapid, another portage. This one's tougher than most. I haven't told Hokoyama today uh, that uh, it's my birthday and he actually should have known. I feel a bit hurt that he didn't, you know, bake me a cake or something or at, at least have some sort of subconscious knowledge that it's my birthday. I mean, I told him a couple times before, so I'm a little bit hurt and I might have to uh, confront him about it. And tell them how I feel. Haku Hokoyama. Hello. What day is it today? I'm not sure. Is there something significant? Well, what day is it today? Oh, man. I don't know. Take a guess. Like day of the week or day of the month? Anything? Anything you can think of. Oh. Well, we passed a thousand K today. Yes. Total. Our, uh... Is it your birthday? There you go. It's your birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Woo. I'll make you some spruce, spruce tea. I was feeling neglected all day. <laughs> Did you know that you hurt me on the inside? Uh-oh. That I was crying inside all day? Oh, man. Well, I'm crying on the inside too right now. Does that help? Yeah. Empathy. Good times. That's all I wanted. <laughs> and the boreal forest weeps for you too. So uh, just another uh, piece of information about the Boreal Forest and its role in uh, uh, climate change. During the, uh, the peak growth season, which is right now, the Boreal Forest, when it goes through that, uh, global CO2 levels actually go down and global oxygen levels actually go up. So incredibly significant, even though it's not the largest piece of forest in the world. <sighs> I can breathe better already. Me too. <laughs> I thought you'd notice. Whip, whip! Well, uh, we're at the base of Snake Falls, and uh, here there's a natural uh, depression in the rock, which is uh, continually flushing water in and out. And it's uh, the dimple is just a perfect shape for somebody to recline in. Incredibly relaxing, and uh, I like that gentle flushing sensation. Oh, that was a good one.
Big broad rapid, and we're going to run it down the right hand side. Action. Forward. Wait for it. Okay, everything you got, baby. All I can really remember, because I'm pretty exhausted at this point, is just uh, rapid after rapid after rapid. Usually we'd have to stop and uh, Frank would go scout the rapids and I would kind of secretly hope, you know, maybe we can line it. Maybe we can portage around it and Frank would come back. Yeah, good line, we're going for it. Inevitably <laughs> we'll go for it. And uh, I always trust Frank's, I always trust rod, Frank's rod, judgment. Rod, 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 but sometimes, you know, you just don't know what to expect and, you know, each one I go down through, my heart rate just goes up a little bit each time. It's wonderful. Uh, you've got a falls every like couple of kilometers. The river is wild, it's free, it's powerful, and it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing that everyone should be allowed to enjoy. So we've been invited in to lunch by Norman and Christine, a couple who live here in Agoki. Let's go see what they got for us. Pork chops. <laughs> Heaven. <laughs> and is the is the Albany River? Is it? Uh, it must be very important to the community. Obviously, is it? A, is it a key oh, part yeah. of the community? Would you say? Oh yeah, it's our highway. Mm -hmm. It's where it's, we have to, it's where we, how we survive from, we get fish and hunt. It's how we move around, get around, I guess, mm -hmm. however you want. And it's been that, like that for uh, for probably hundreds of years, I guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Way before our time, anyways. Mm -hmm. Albany River, softly, gently flowing. Ever after going to the sea. We're here in the Kanagami Valley, and as you can see behind me, there are thousands and thousands of crushed rocks left behind by receding glaciers. And in and amongst the rocks are these fossils with shells and fish left behind, remnants. So a little bit of geological history here in the Kanagami Valley. Okay, so we are here in the town of Memamatawa, and this was a former Hudson's Bay trading post and native village. It's right at the forks of the Kanagami and the Cabina rivers. We're now turning off the Kanagami and going up the Cabina. Um, so at one point, this would have been a major highway, basically, that the natives and voyagers would have used. Now it's abandoned. Not many people come here anymore. The uh, people have moved out to the roads, basically. Um, and one thing that we can really reflect on, Taku and I especially, is coming up the river with all of these mosquitoes that the people who used to be here, they used to live with these guys and they didn't have a mosquito uh, mesh tent like we have. 
and they didn't have bug jackets, they didn't have DEET, so they would have had to exist here year-round and during the entire summer in this Hudson's Bay lowlands area with these bugs and somehow manage. So uh, people were a lot tougher back then. They, they may do with a lot less. So whenever it gets really bad, we can look at these guys and get a little bit of perspective. Okoyama. Hello. What do you think? Do you want to restart the village? Maybe live here? <laughs> Considering the bugs, I'd say yes. Let's call our families. Canada Highway. We just nipped down here uh, coming around the Cabina River and now we're about to head into Valentine Creek and north into the Pivabisca system and this whole section of the Trans-Canada Northern Ontario is the limit and that's basically it's a focal point, the corridor for all uh, logging operations. So north of here and south of here in the Jello area it's all a monoculture. It's been logged for years and it's, uh, it's a well-established industry. So what we basically don't want is to have something like this move up into the wild boreal where uh, right now everything is very pristine it's a diverse forest with lots of wildlife Here in the Boreal Forest, uh, we've seen a lot of animals. We've seen uh, bears, moose, snakes, um, martens, beaver, etc. But we haven't seen the very elusive wolf. But at this campsite, we've actually found signs of it. So uh, right over here, if you'll follow along, is one very big uh, wolf track. So uh, pretty much the same size as my hand. If I put my hand down beside it, it's going to uh, pretty much match it. And uh, over here, right beside the wolf track, is a large moose track. And inside the moose track is the smaller track of the calf. So the main prey, or one of the main prey of wolves in the Boreal are, uh, are moose, in particular the calves. The calves are weaker easier to take down so often they'll track or chase down a mother and calf until uh, they pin them into a certain point and then take the calf out so this uh, mother and calf are obviously being hunted by a wolf pack
back here, in the earlier pages, are uh, a collection of haikus. Mm -hmm. Usually try to compose one a day, and uh, sometimes I just uh, choose random characters to write, because uh, I find them very reflective and meditative. And does the the surroundings, the boreal and that sort of thing, does it uh, lend itself to such a practice? Oh yeah, yeah, ab absolutely, because uh, your, your daily uh, existence in the boreal is reduced to pretty much, in our case at least, moving forward and then just doing what's necessary for survival and comfort for the, for the day and night. And uh, so it kind of removes all the clutter. Uh, I feel like it makes your mind a lot more pure and uh, yeah, just easier, more, more conducive to this sort of thing. In, in the city, there's a lot of distraction, a lot of annoying details of life, and all those things are removed. Um, ideally, you should be able to do this kind of thing regardless of the distractions, but any little, uh, any little uh, assistance helps, in my case especially, and uh, the Boreal is uh, definitely conducive to that, especially in such an isolated and a very wild setting, like no people around, no signs of civilization. It's very, very relaxing. I shall continue. We are at the confluence of the Missinabe and Matagami rivers. Uh, we've just come through the Pivabisca system, down the Missinabe, and now is our big upstream section, probably the toughest part of the trip. 450 kilometers upstream on this river and also on the Grassy River uh, after it. And Timmins is a big mining town that's on this river. And uh, what happens with mining when you have all the waste rock, a lot of it leaches into the land. So there's actually uh, mercury, uh, low level mercury in this river. So fish have been uh, recorded in this river with low level mercury, so it's suggested not to eat the fish in this river and also suggested not to drink the water. A swimming mouse, I've never seen that before, here in the Matagami River. I can't eat him though, he's full of mercury. Yeah, so in the Matagami, uh, there's lots of signs of, uh, of how the river's been affected uh, pollution-wise, for sure. Uh, you can see along the edge here, there's this uh, ugly brown foam that's all churned up, probably a combination of uh, sewage and pulp mill effluent. Um, the water is very, it's, it's like almost a coffee color. Compared to all the free-flowing rivers we had, uh, crystal clear, uh, brilliant, you don't have this brown foam on the edge, so you can really, really easily see the physical differences. Like, we're not going to drink this water, obviously. We're getting from the side streams and uh, for obvious reasons, so it uh, really makes you uh, appreciate uh, the wild rivers. You notice that when people wake up in the morning or go to work and you know all the businesses fire up their lights or once they go home or you know you can tell when it's hot and air conditioners are going on and it, it really affected our paddling you know when when the water level uh, was low because the dams shut down uh, you know we had a labyrinth to paddle through uh, when the water levels went up uh, sometimes we had nice glassy sections but we also had incredible uh, upstream current that we had to paddle against and at first I was very upset at the dam itself, but I realized what it what it really is symptomatic of is that, uh, you know, people's daily um, uh, power consumption, which is, you know, controlling the flow of water, and we could feel it, you know, in our bones and in our muscles, and, you know, mentally and physically it was very, very, very taxing dealing with it, and it really drove home the message to me. I don't want to be a hypocrite because I, I use electricity just like the next person, but I'm very conscious every day and about you know how much I use and I try to reduce my impact and you know just damming up more rivers is a very very short-sighted solution because there's only so many rivers you can dam up before you know you irreversibly alter the world ecosystem and you know like we've been saying throughout this entire trip the boreal forest is a globally important resource it, it supplies the air you know oxygen um, it keeps carbon levels in check and if you take away enough of that that buffer system just disappears and you know the world's gonna spiral into into a horrible horrible mess so 
paddling up this river has really driven home the message. What we can do, small things that we can do on a daily basis, is really what's going to help save the world. And we need to act soon, very soon. I'm standing here at the base of the first of four dams on the Metagamy River and behind me here is the channel we actually paddled up last night. Uh, overnight I guess they shut the water off and the channel disappeared. It's dry land. So it shows you what a dramatic effect dams can have on the characteristic of rivers. Alright, so we're here at the uh, base of the four dams that uh, plug up the Metagamy. And so we have a 21 kilometer portage to get around them. Uh, if you try to portage around dams individually and go in between the dams, uh, it's quite dangerous because the uh, dams are programmed basically to go randomly on and off depending on, on power needs. So uh, we have to go around all four of them at once on this uh, little road. So, long day of walking. We're about 2K into this 21K portage and big loud bang, tire blew, clean through, uh, ripped right through the actual tire itself, inner tube, everything gone. Uh, we knew it was kind of weak because wonky from our about 55K we had uh, uh, to get around the cabina and into the uh, Pivabisca system, but now now it's just dead, so we got to figure out some way to keep it going. Uh, probably stuff it with leaves or something, but it's going to be, it's not going to work that well no matter what. All right, so we've put duct tape in there. I've uh, cut out the inside of the inner tube and lined it throughout the uh, tire and now we got to give it some volume so uh, what we've got is we've got some contributions from both we've got Taku's long underwear got my little uh, quick dry towel my fleece pants fleece shirt all extraneous goods if they get burned into the road will survive Take two, let's see what happens this time. So here we are, uh, almost a couple hours into it since the repair. It's still holding up, but it's uh, much like dragging an anchor through the sand. And uh, Taku's tendons from paddling, kind of acting up a little bit, so I'm just gonna uh, try to keep on moving forward. It's still better than carrying, though. Definitely. Right, Flaku? Oh yeah, <laughs> whole bunch better. Taku Hokuyama, how was that portage? Uh, that was uh, pretty, 
very physically demanding. I keep saying over and over again towards the camera that this was the hardest leg, this was the hardest leg. They all seem hard right now. Twenty-one kilometers, the bum wheel, uphill all the way. I'm spent. We just had a bear swim literally about 20 feet in front of our boat here on the metagamy. He was just kind of running along shore, then he cut under the water and just started swimming right in front of us. And when he kind of got close, he kind of thought, oh, I don't want to hang out with those guys. Did a 180 and headed back into the woods. Day 50. Riding a moose. And I've worked at uh, the mill in Smooth Rock Falls for uh, 32 years. And I also bought a business uh, eight years ago called Moose Motel. Mm -hmm. I'm a vice president of Strong, okay. uh, uh, saving uh, the northern uh, uh, region, mm -hmm. Ontario group. We want to save our jobs because right now, all in the northern Ontario, they're closing down mills. There's up to 40 mills that have been closed down. And what it is, we're fighting, uh, we're lobbying the government that uh, they close down the mill, but they still keep the uh, forest. Yeah. So basically these big corporations are kind of uh, taking all the wood and leaving all the people who actually work out in the cold. Yes. That's what's happening. That's what they're doing. They're depopulating the north. They are what I'm going, it's a personal thing for me, and they're cancer of the north. That's what they are, those companies. Yep. When big companies, they think they can own everything, they buy everything, then they can shut it down. They don't care about the people of the north. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But hopefully at the end of the run, we'll still be around and kick in. And like I said, we're tough, we're from the north, we'll survive. Exactly, JC's not leaving. Nope, I'm not. <laughs> I decide I'm gonna go outfitter. I'm gonna give tours to Moussini. Gotta give tours all over. Uh, yeah, yeah. I uh, rent the uh, ice huts. Yeah. 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 So I, I think if, if you're creative, you can always make it work in the north. There, there's alternatives. If, if something shuts down, there's alternatives to kind of find a way to stay where you love, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You can buy a house very cheap in Smooth Rock Falls right now. My brother-in-law bought a house on Ross Road, brick finish, basement finish, little garage for $12,000. So just walking around the town of Smooth Rock Falls here and you can see a lot of the businesses are closed for sale as well as a lot of the houses. Um, Jean-Claude was saying like houses are going like $4,000 to $20,000 uh, for a house on a lot. Um, probably every third house is for sale and every third business. So um, you can see what happens when a uh, big corporation owns a mill, just pulls out, keeps all the wood rights, but leaves the families out to dry. Hello there. Uh, 
I've had this uh, little toe issue for a while, like an infected toe, so now I kind of have this full whole procedure to manage it every night. Um, it basically, it's like a little bit of an abscess down deep in the side of the toe, so I uh, stuff it with gauze now to uh, prevent it from uh, closing up and, and creating an area where the infection can kind of take hold. So. Okay, so we're just passing through the town of Timmins on the Metagamy River. And this is basically, it's, a, it's the biggest town in this area in the north and it's right on the river. Um, it's a big uh, pulp mill town, lots of mining in the area, um, plus just the human impact itself. And it all kind of uh, eventually goes into the river. So we've experienced that on our way up. Uh, we haven't been able to swim, uh, can't drink the water from the river. Uh, we get it from the side creeks. Um, so yeah, you can definitely feel it as you're canoeing up a river, the, the effect uh, these industries and people in general can have on a river. So it uh, really makes you appreciate the, uh, the wild rivers, the clean, clear rivers that we've experienced earlier in the trip and hopefully now we'll experience uh, upstream from here. We are above Timmins on the Metagmi River and the water is clean and clear and pure. Um, we haven't swum in two weeks because of the uh, the manky conditions, so now we can swim and drink at our leisure. Yee oh, yeah. It's also supposed to be plus two tonight. I'm already cold. abandoned mine site here in the Grassy River area and as you can see it's just a big big pile of rocks and what happens is when they, when they mine this area for gold and what have you they dig everything up from underneath the earth it comes on top of the land and just like it is now it rains rain brings it into the water systems you get mercury you get lead you get other bad stuff going in the water Portage, warm up, dance. So we are here in Gauganda and we haven't seen ourselves for a while and we've uh, We've lost a bit of weight here on this trip. 
2,500 kilometers, uh, 10 hour days, grinding it out upstream, downstream, lakes, white water. And uh, yeah, there's, I'd say what, 15, 20 pounds, Hoko? What do you think? Yeah, it's not looking too good there. Let's see, step back for a second. See what you got here. Mm hmm. Not much. This man used to be fat. Come to the Frank program. Lose some weight. Spend a summer outside. It'll be great. I did. We are in the town of Gauganda, and we are here to uh, talk to a fellow named Bill Fox. He has uh, lived and worked in the Boreal Forest for over 40 years, and we're just going to go in and have a little chat with him. It's, it's surprising a lot of wood disappears down across the road right here, you know, goes through right here. Well, the wood in part of the uh, poplar and the socket and, and that are all going to the Grant Forest products in uh, in Engelhardt, and they say they use a hundred truckloads of wood a day to keep their plant going. They're, for moose hunting and that, they say, which is the main hunting up here, is moose hunting. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a considerable drop in the number of moose, and I'm not, I'm not saying that it's a forestry, mm -hmm. but a combination of now they even say the global warming, maybe the rise in temperature is maybe causing some sort of change to the moose. Well, it's certainly changing the environment. Mm -hmm. Day 60. Woo! This is a white pine. It is not native to the Boreal Forest. We've moved out of the Boreal Forest into the uh, Great Lakes, St. Lawrence, Highland region of the Canadian Shield. So uh, this marks our exit from the Boreal Forest. It's been a, uh, an incredible experience. And now the final part of the mission is about a two week paddle through some of the more popular Southern Ontario canoe tripping country like Tomogamy and the French River in Georgian Bay to ultimately get to our cottage where we will deliver the canoe to its final resting place. leaving humanity to run with the horses. Okoyama, where are you? Georgia Bay! Woo!
So Taku and I are just having uh, a little master and commander moment. We're here at the Cape, the farthest easternmost point of uh, Kilbear Provincial Park. And just behind me here, this big patch of blue stretching in is Blind Bay. And six kilometers down here at the end is my cottage. Where we're going to deliver this canoe and conclude our journey here on day 75. So, Cuban, some Canadian whiskey at the point to celebrate the journey. So this is us arriving at the cottage. We've come down from the point and here it is, the dock, the rock, everything as I remember when I grew up. And this canoe is about to be delivered, baby. Oh, wow. Here we are. And I'm gonna keep on fighting. It's too bad people just let go. You make a rally or you have a big meeting or something. Oh, everything's gonna be resolved tomorrow. No, that's not the way it works. Fight, keep on fighting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at the end, if you don't win, well, at least you didn't sit home and cry about it. Yeah. <laughs>